Hi, this is Jeff Heaton. Welcome to Applications of Deep Neural Networks with Washington University. In this module, we're going to begin to look at time series, in particular how to encode data for time series. Because whether you're using a convolution neural network or a LSTM, you need to put the data into a specific form for time series. For the latest on my AI course and projects, click subscribe and the bell next to it to be notified of every new video. First, let me show you what I mean by time series and sequences, because these become important concepts for the code that we're going to actually create in this module that makes use of LSTMs and temporal convolution neural networks. So if you think of tabular data, we'll just start with tabular data, the miles per gallon data set that we've used a couple of times as we've gone through this course. This has cars where it'll give you like the acceleration of a car, the miles per gallon, the weight, doesn't really matter, just a series of these. And then maybe like a type, the actual miles per gallon data set doesn't have that, but maybe like a car or a truck. Acceleration, I don't know, these can all be like normalized values of 0.8, maybe that's a pretty fast one. Miles per gallon, maybe it's now a pretty slow one. Weight is going to be a mid-ranged and type. We'll do just car or truck, so zero will mean car. So this is one row of data that we're going to try to potentially predict something. Now what I'm going to have that we're trying to predict is maybe the brand of car. And we'll do that with dummy variables. So there'll be like three different types of, of brand that the car could be. That's going, those are dummy variables and that is going to be the target. And for this particular car, maybe it's type B. Now if you create something like this, what your neural network is going to look like Traditionally speaking, as far as neural networks are going to be, you're going to have these four that we have here as the input. So you're going to have a four, a four neuron neural network that has each of these basically going into one of these. And it's a neural network, you're going to have multiple layers, you're going to have all sorts of stuff going on in there. And then finally, this part, that is going to become your output neurons. So one for A, B, and C. So this is basically your, your typical sort of neural network for tabular data that we've had throughout this entire class. Now for computer vision, this the sequences get really very similar. Now what, what we do with this is we might have a sequence of cars coming in. So say for example, we weren't trying to predict is it A, B, or C. Maybe we're trying to predict in the future. We're trying to predict what type of car we're going to actually sell next. So to do that, traditionally what you would do is you would just add additional input neurons into this. You'd put four more here, and you would essentially time series it. So this would be, uh, the top one would basically be, that would be slot one, the second one would be two. And you keep adding groups of four neurons onto this as you, as you went through. And you would say, okay, I have a sequence. I've sold this type of car first, then I sold maybe another one that I would that I would fill in here, and it's it's next, it's in spot number two. What type are we going to sell next? So you would essentially build these sequences up as you had the data coming in. So you you have your data, that's your X, and then Y is essentially the next, the very next thing. So the next type. That's how you that's how you traditionally did this before we had L LSTMs and temporal convolution neural networks, you would encode it. You would do time series encoding where you basically would do a sliding window where the window was if you sold cars one, two, three, and four, your first window would be maybe those four and you'd sold car five next. Car five would be your output. Then as you took this further and further into the future, you might then use these to predict that. So it keeps sliding down. You would use the fact that you sold cars two, three, four, five to predict that you had sold car six. That's called a sequence. And the sequence, each of these, that's not just one, necessarily one value, that's all four of those values, acceleration, weight, type, all of these, that you would be feeding into the neural network to predict. Now, the important distinction here between the convolution neural networks and the LSTMs, LSTMs in particular, 
is how many neurons you have. As you added more and more values to your sequence, so in this case we had a sequence of size 4, as you add more and more of those values into your sequence, your number of input neurons grows. And that's one of the limitations of these. Say you have a sequence size of 100. Now still, using larger and larger sequence sizes always adds on additional complexity, whether you're doing a traditional neural network or an LSTM, because you have to sort of unfold this in the back propagation when it starts to actually train it. But let's see how a LSTM would actually work. We would not be adding these additional neurons on the bottom here. We would simply be passing in each of these rows of cars. So maybe you sold five cars in a row. That was your sequence size. As you pass those five cars in, each of the four predictors, the acceleration, miles per gallon, weight, and type, those would all go to your four input neurons. You would simply, for the next one, you would send, you would call the neural network again, and you would send the second one in the sequence. So as this goes through, you are providing the neural network with more and more and more cars. Now the difference is a traditional neural network that's not recurrent, if you pass in these values for acceleration, miles per gallon, weight, and type, if you pass in 0 0.8, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, and 0, you're always going to get the same type. Just like with the iris data set that we did. The same four inputs are always going to produce the same output for a given neural network unless you retrain it. These recurrent neural networks maintain state so when you send in one group of inputs, it'll give you a prediction. It always gives you a prediction. Then when you send in the second one, the fact that it's seen that previous input, so this could let you look at, okay, your car dealer sold these five cars in a row. Based on that, I'm predicting that the next car sold will be something else. You're not increasing the input neurons. You're simply sending in more and more values to the neural networks and the internal state of the neural network changes for each prediction you make and that affects subsequent predictions. Now one thing that is very important to understand with these, because this gets into what a sequence really is, is say you are doing exactly like I, I had there. You've, you've sold car one, then you've sold car two, then car three. Now each of those would be input vectors of the, of the four values to indicate the sort of car that it is. And then sold car four, and then five. So as you presented, each of these to the neural network, if your sequence size is five, each of those, and here's your neural network. So as you present each of those four cars to your neural network in sequence, so I mean this one's coming first, second, third, and fourth, the internal state of that neural network is changing. So the fact that you gave it one first and then two and then three for each of these, it is predicting what it thinks that the next car would be. The question with a sequence comes in, when does that internal state for that neural network reset. It resets at the beginning and the end of the sequence. So if we had defined a sequence size of four, like we have here, it would get reset here and reset here. Then when you slide it forward, because you don't want to make just one prediction, now you want to predict two, three, four. You want to predict those using two, three, four, and five and predict what's going to come next. Now you would reset it here and reset it here. So now let's see what this would actually look like in code, in Python. So say you were going to try to predict something into the future like stock prices. You're now going to have essentially three dimensions, whereas previously you had two. The first axis is going to be your training set elements. So, so these are like your rows in your other data sets that we've seen. These are the individual training elements that you're giving the neural network to predict. Each one of these, so however big your first axis is, however big axis one is, that's how big your Y has to be because this is how many predictions this training set is going to actually make. Your second axis axis are going to be the members of the sequence. So those are your time steps. So day one, day two, day three, day four. It depends completely on how you want to represent this in a CSV file. Often those are the actual, axis two becomes the actual rows. The rows become the time step. Axis one, the training set elements, you can't really tell that from the CSV file. You only know that based on how big of a sequence you set to have. And it's also important to note too, these sequence sizes are always set in sort of a maximum sequence. So if you set your sequence size of 10, 
then you're going to have 10 time steps that will come into it. Now, if you don't have 10 elements for a particular sequence you're training on, usually you zero out the remaining of the values on the second axis. Because these neural networks are smart enough to learn when things contract and expand. And then features in the data, like the inputs, those are your third ones. So those are like your columns on most of the data sets we've seen before, like the miles per gallon that we just saw in the previous one. The miles per gallon, the engine size, the type of car, that's on your third axis. So these three axes all together you need. So you're basically now dealing with a cube. So let's look at the code where we essentially have a time series. So this is a stock price. It was at 32, then it moved to 41, then it moved to 32, then it moved to 20, then it moved to 15. And you might want to determine if at each point in the sequence, if you consider it a buy or sell or a hold. One would mean buy, negative one would mean sell, and zero would mean hold. So for each of these rows, each of these train set elements, you've got to have a Y value. You notice I did put brackets around this. So this is actually a two dimensional array. The reason I did this is because you might want to have more than one input for this. Maybe you wanted to actually put the volume for each of these stocks too. So how many, it was 32 and the volume, maybe it was heavy trading this day, not so heavy trading that day. So you can put multiple different values in here. In fact, that is, that is quite common. If these were images, like you were trying to predict on a video sequence, then there would be lots of values that you are adding into here. In fact, you would probably add 2D arrays into here to represent the grid of the, of the pixels. And we can see that this is essentially building a CSV file. Here is what it would look like. So your, your X's are the first column and then the predicted Y's. Now, like I was starting to tell you before, we might want to put in the volume. So that, those are two common statistics that you track in the stock market the stock price and then the volume. Both of these go up and down and fluctuate. We're predicting neither of these two. We're trying to predict if we want to buy, sell, or hold. And if we create this sort of data, we can see what it looks like. Notice it's sort of an array of arrays. You have the outer array and then inside of that array, you've got each of these pairs of stock price and volume. And we can basically convert that into something that is very CSV-like. Now the sequence size, you can't tell. The sequence size might be three. If it's three, you're going to predict on zero through two is one sequence and predict three. Then your next sequence is going to be one, two, three, and you're gonna predict four, and so on. Now this is where we actually define the sequence size. So here we have five, one, two, three, four, five, as our sequence size. And we are creating truly, this is three dimensional data because that's the first dimension, second and third. You can count the number of leading braces to, to know that. We can print this and three dimensional data looks a lot more messy, but this is truly the type of data that we're going to start creating in the next parts of this module because we're going to actually train the LSTMs on data like that. Even if there's just one feature, you still need the three dimensions. This is where you're taking the stock price and you've just got one value, but you're setting up those three dimensions because you don't happen to have a volume. So even if there's just one, you've got to deal with the 3D cube. Thank you for watching this video. In the next video, we're going to look at recurrent neural networks, in particular LSTM and GRU. This content changes often, so subscribe to the channel to stay up to date on this course and other topics in artificial intelligence.